and tell us about growing up in Calypius. That lady back here's got more memorabilia than I do. Uh, I think she goes back a little further. <laughs> well, you want to show me? You well, show you're going to have to tell about it. I tell you what, you go right ahead and do that right now. Well, let me oh, get up here. here. I didn't know I was going to do show and tell. <laughs> oh, yeah, show and tell. This is a picture that was taken in a slower and uh, this is Mary Myrtle and Mary Davidson, and their father had a store in Cleveland, and she was born in 1898, and her sister was born 18 months younger. And they had a roving photographer that came and set up, you know, brought all the props and set them up to have the picture made. But we just thought it was an interesting picture, and it was made in Cleveland. So. Uh, how what uh, what reminded me uh, of this picture is. Uh, and I, I mentioned in here about the uh, uh, Cleveland was a boarding school, and and the uh, the girls, well, girls and boys both, they had to work. And uh, I thought, well, that looks like a laundry. And that's one of the things they did. They worked in the lunchroom, and then they worked in the laundry with all the sheets and stuff like that. But she said this was a, this is a pretty good pretty good story right there. It's made up. <laughs> And you saw, you see the 30, the 37 Cleveland basketball team, I mentioned that in a minute, had four McCoy girls on there. And y'all may, y'all may know some of these names here, but I missed all this. <laughs> what was the girls team anyway, wasn't it? Pardon? It was the girls team anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's why you missed it. <laughs> Johnny Jackson. I was uh, born in Cleveland in 1948, and I lived there to uh, 1970. And this is going to be my memories and how it used to be. Not how it is now, but this is how it used to be. Uh, now, Cleveland, uh, they've got a library still there. They've got a small grocery store and uh, you can buy tires there, used tires there, and uh, there's one other. Oh, the water department is located in Cleveland. Besides that, it's nothing like it was when I grew up in Cleveland. Uh, I'm going, you're going to have to use your imagination and go back. And I'm going to try to describe what Cleveland, anything I tell you about is what I saw and what I did in Cleveland. And this is going to be back when I was 14, 13, 14, 15 years old. Uh, you, can, uh, you can even call it Chatty Bean if you like. <laughs> uh, most people would know it as Chatty Bean. When, uh, when, I was in Mississippi, when I went to Rest in Mississippi State in 1968, there was a girl there that was helping me fill out papers, and she was asking me questions, and she was writing down, and she come to it, and she said, where are you from? And I said, Cleveland. She looked down and she stood there and she had her pen and she sat there a few minutes and she looked up at me and she said, you're going to spell that for me. And I spelled it for her she wrote, she said, oh, Chatty Bean. And I said, well, if that's, that's close enough. She looked back at the paper she was writing on and uh, she paused for a minute, looked back, she said, is that in Mississippi? And I said, barely, but it is in Mississippi. Uh, in uh, just a short kind of introduction to my family. My mother's name was Neva Mathis Jackson. She lived at Providence. She taught school for 43 years at, at uh, Cleveland and Providence. Uh, my daddy's name was Daniel David Jackson. He ran a service <coughs> station in Cleveland. We had a car junkyard in our house in Cleveland. He was a mail carrier. And uh, even uh, daddy owned the, remember the blue and white service station down here? For 15 and four cross, Daddy owned that service station for two years. It was uh, uh, Mr. Tapp, Bartlett Tapp, oil company, and this service station was connected with it. So when I was uh, seventh and eighth grade, this was a 24-hour service station, and Daddy'd get me up at five o'clock in the morning and bring me to Ripley Saturday and Sunday 
to work at the service station. Now, I wouldn't pump gas. I don't know. I was too young for that. And uh, back then, we didn't have so many car washes. So people brought their cars in to be detailed, and that was my job. Wash them, clean them, inside and out. So that's where I spent my time in seventh and eighth grade. And uh, of course, Daddy was Daddy was run a pretty tight ship. He'd come back. He he inspected it all. And if you didn't do it right, for some reason or another, you had to do it all over again. Uh, so we spent two years there. I think it was rougher on him uh, being at that service station from six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night, and then another crew came in. So he had that for two years, and and uh, he gave it up after that. Uh, also here with me today is my wife, Mary Jane Quinn Jackson. She just retired school teacher. <laughs> and I, what did you say, 43 years too? 34. Well, that's a whole lot longer than I do. <laughs> she was a former Miss Tipper County back in 19... Well, well, she told me not to use that phrase. <laughs> 43. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> just faded in the Miss Mississippi contest back, oh, in the same year. Uh, the tip, uh, I looked in the dictionary about cleavage, and the definition is a mineral water containing iron is a cleavage spring. Now, right below cleavage, uh, the buildings in cleavage, a little winding path down there, and the, the rocks were huge against on a wall, kind of, and then they were great big rocks around. Them. And these rocks were covered up with fossils. And that's where we played a lot. It was always cool. You could always get a cold drink of water. At one time, it just water was just running out of the, the bank. But somebody put a pipe in there and forced the water to come out the pipe. And I can always remember they had a little tin cup hanging down there. So anybody want to drink the water, they get that. <laughs> Nowadays, you wouldn't do that. Drink that and hang it back up. And the next one, drink that up. But it was a real great, cool place to be. And uh, that's where Cleavage got its name. And that's the original name of Cleavage, which I didn't really know at the time. Now, the way I really found out about Cleavage's uh, name was uh, when I was about three years old, and uh, you can look at my picture. There's a lady stopped by at a service station, three or four years old, and she was coming from Alabama, going through Tennessee, going back to her home in Texas. <laughs> And she saw the sign up on the road that said cleavage. And she detoured through and she stopped at the service station. And she wanted to know where the cleavage school was because her daddy went to school there years ago. And of course they told her, oh, you're right there just 100 yards down the road. And she wanted to take my picture in front of the corners. And uh, that's the picture I got here. Around three months later, we got a letter in the mail. And on the front of the letter, it said, Filling station, Cleveland, Mississippi. <laughs> no zip code, no box number, nothing. But uh, didn't have to have one. Everybody knew everybody in Cleveland anyway. So I opened up the, opened up the uh, picture, and there was a card in it with my picture in it. And the card was a uh, Christmas card. And the, letter, the lady had sent it back. And inside the card, it said to the little boy, at the filling station. <laughs> and uh, that's why I knew uh, Cleveland was originally named Cleveland Springs. <coughs> if you go back with me, like I said, there's, there's nothing, no business is harder than Cleveland now. If you go back with me, use your imagination. You're coming from Walnut, cross Cleveland Bottom, and you go up a hill, and Cleveland is kind of on the plain. And as you come in Cleveland, on the right is Baptist Church. Baptist Church I remember back in when I was 12, 13 years old. Same church, same music. Now, I don't think it changed much about it. On the left is Cleveland School. And most of the time you think, they think of Cleveland, it's a Cleveland School. Right next to the Cleveland School, and actually on the driveway going up was my daddy's service station. And then you come to a line of buildings. And... Uh, the line of buildings were all connected. People lived in the back of these buildings and had businesses in front of them. At one time, there, when I was growing up, there were there was 12, 11 or 12 businesses in Cleveland. 
So, uh, you know, it was a rocking little town there for a while. And of course, as we mentioned a while ago, Seeker was bigger than Walnut. If they hadn't run the railroad through, uh, Walnut, Seeker would probably still be bigger than Walnut. The, uh, so the road we're in coming into Seeker is old highway, or excuse me, original Highway 72. And I didn't know that until just recently. And it, uh, of course, back then it was a gravel road and all that. All right, the line of buildings is there. There's one driveway through it because there's a home in the back of it, but it's all connected. Uh, next, we had a uh, welding shop, Cleveland, and then another service station. And that was the original service station, and I'll get into that a little bit later, too. Uh, about the schools, since that's, that's the big thing. In the 1800s, uh, the Cleveland School was called Cleveland Springs Institute. And it was a boarding school, as we mentioned long ago. And of course, you know, people couldn't, uh, back then we got gravel roads and we had horses and, and carriages and people couldn't come and go back to school. So they had, to, uh, they had people from out of state, people from Ripley, all over the county went to Cleveland. And of course, they had a boarding school. And the picture showed uh, that uh, that you got, it looked like a laundry to me when I saw it. The, wind, the girls or everybody was, was uh, I don't know if they charged them tuition to live there, I'm not sure about anything like that, but I know they had to work. Everybody worked. They worked in the laundry and they worked in the lunchroom. And even, uh, even years later, the people of Cleveland opened up their homes to students. You could go, uh, I, I know of two or three that live in one house during the week. And they were, again, they would help the family out any way they could when they wasn't in school. But it was just amazing to me that people would open up their homes to anybody, say, yeah, come live with us during the week. A lot of them, uh, uh, they would bring them on Sunday night and go to school the week, pick them up maybe on Friday. And again, it didn't make any difference if you lived 10 miles from school, there was no way you could go and come every day. So uh, people supported the school at Cleveland. The, uh, <clears throat> in 1921, Cleveland changed its name to Cleveland Agriculture High School. In 1923, they fielded the first football team in the county. And I suppose it's pretty hard to find schedules to play games because there just wasn't that many. And uh, Cleveland ended up playing Ole Miss freshman team. And uh, I had an uncle in 1928, my uncle Lenoy Mathis played on the football team. Mary Jane's father, Perry Quinn, in the same year played on the football team. And uh, it's, it's hard to figure out. I, I think a lot of them just came back to play football then, we went, then they left and went to work. Come back the next year, they played football <laughs> and they left and went to work. So there's a lot of them graduated two or three years in a row. So, so there was no rules and regulations, but they, they did play football. At Cleveland, they had a coach by the name of George Duke Humphreys. And he later on became president of Mississippi State University. And they even named the the basketball coliseum, the hump, after this guy, I thought, isn't that amazing? You come from Cleveland and then up Mississippi State president? In 1930, around 1930, this took a while, they built a new school there at Cleveland. And if you see pictures of the new school and you see pictures of the school that's sitting there today, the front of it, the face of it, it looks just exactly like it. They didn't change a thing. Built a new gym at this time. Uh, of course, when you go in in the school, you can see a lot of difference. They put a lot of money into the school over there because it just goes through the eighth grade now. But uh, and uh, it showed you basketball picture in 1937. The first state championship in Tipper County was won by the uh, 37 girls team from Cleveland. And like I mentioned, there was four of the McCoy girls. And I've heard people talk to them before how good, how fast, and quick they were. Now, a, a strange fact about it, uh, Cleveland didn't even win the county tournament that year. They had to forfeit their game in the county tournament. 
because for some reason they played the county tournament and the north half at the same time. It's unheard of today. But what Cleveland went on and won the north half, they beat a team named Beulah Hubbard, 38 and 34 in the state championship, bringing home the first state championship for, for Tipper County. The uh, couple of memories I have about about the school, early school was, of course, my mother and daddy both went to school there and graduated there. They have uh, a all-class reunion every single year. Now, I, th I think now it's not every year. Maybe it is, but I remember they had it every year. People came back from out of state. People in the community came. They brought pictures, and, uh, and it just had a huge crowd on that Sunday evening when they had the when they had the reunion. And from dealing with reunions before, most of the time people who live within five miles of where they're gonna have a reunion won't come. But the ones who live way off do. But they, the people that around Cleveland supported it and uh, they just had a great time. The other thing I remember is we had a bell built on a stand outside the eighth grade classroom, which was the principal's room. Back then, the principal had to teach school. And they'd cut a hole through the wall and tied a rope to the bell. <laughs> and he rung that bell. We didn't have bells inside when I was at Cleveland. But he rung that bell to start school and end school and for recesses and things like that. And a big tradition around Cleveland at that time on uh, for Halloween, we'd get a bunch of boys. And it took a bunch of boys. This is a big bell, and it was on a wood stand. <laughs> And they would load that bale up in the back of a pickup and they'd ride all through the countryside and through town and ring that bell and ring that bell. <laughs> and the next morning, the bell was always back in its original position. And they'd done that for years. I don't think they do it anymore. When I was coming up, they did that. That was the nicest thing they did. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of windows. Of course, Cleveland had some great big windows store building, there was a lot of windows painted with paint, not soap, they painted them with paint, so. But anyway, <laughs> we, got, we got some bad boys to clean. <laughs> the uh, first memory that I have of living in Cleveland, and like I said, I was born in 1948, we, I was in a little red two-room house. And, but the first memory I have is of a Model T Ford. And, I thought back so many times, how can I remember something like that? I can't even remember somebody's name that I went to school with all my life. But when I was one or two years old, I had colic real bad. And they would put, mother and daddy put me in that Model T forward and ride me around and say, go to sleep just like that. But what I remember about it is the smell of the metal. It, I, I can't tell you how the smell of what, but the smell of that metal, I can remember. And. Uh, the, uh, I remember the dashboard. I think it had two little, maybe a speedometer, maybe a gas thing on it, whatever. But I can remember that. And uh, of course, that's what put me to sleep many nights. <clears throat> when, uh, when we moved out of the little two, two room red house, we moved uptown Cleveland. And uh, we lived in a gingerbread house, what I call it, with all the ornaments on them. The, the house looked like it was two story, but it wasn't. Just, it, 12, 15 foot ceilings, they had six rooms in it. And uh, they had, everybody wants a bay window put on their house today? Ooh, we had one. <laughs> uh, and a fence on the front porch. And, and uh, But the old house was about to fall in when, when we moved there. And uh, of course, later years, Mother and Daddy finally had to build when I told Mary Jane before that you could look out the side of the windows and see the ground. And uh, of course, the, uh, Two, two memories I have of, of winter and summer was that we had a, uh, it was about a four to five foot cold burning heater. And that's the only heater we had in the house. Because they put you bed at night, cover you up with pin quilts. You couldn't move. You didn't want to move. If you did, you'd hit a hot cold spot. But you get up in the morning and you run in front of that heater, you burn on one side, you flip over, you burn on the other side. But that's all, that was the only heat we had in the house. Now, in the summertime, we had one winter fan. And this is a memory I'll never forget. Of course, that winter fan was, when it, you turned it on, it pulled air from outside into the house. 
And of course, all it did was stir up mosquitoes. And there you are trying to go to sleep, sweat running off of you, mosquitoes buzz, buzzing around your head. Well, the only thing you can do is to cut, completely cover up and make no difference how hot it was. Keep the mosquitoes off of you. And that, what it brought in was the smell of chicken houses and turkey houses, which we lived right, we lived right close to. Now that was bad enough, but that wasn't the worst. Once a year, they would come in and they would burn the beaks off the turkeys and chickens and, and burn the to toenails off so they would be pecking and killing each other and stuff like that. And that is the awfulest stench I have ever smelled in my life. I still can't face a turkey today because that's the only thing I can remember, that smell. But that's all we had, hot and cold weather. Uh, we didn't even have a bathroom until I was in the ninth or 10th grade, I can't remember which. Uh, we did have a slob jar sitting there on the back porch for emergencies and cold weather. And we had a little red house with the uh, half moon on it. And, uh, and we were way ahead of a lot of folks because we had a two-seater. <laughs> and of course, I always had the Sears and Roebuck catalog to read uh, when you had time. Uh, going back to the people in, in Cleveland, and the kids I grew up with, baseball was, of course, our, we didn't care about school. We had to work all the time, and then we played baseball. Baseball cards was a great thing back then. I have still got some 1950 baseball cards that I had back when I was a kid. And, uh, but everybody collected, didn't have much, we didn't, we couldn't even get a hold of a nickel very often. When we did, we didn't blow it, we brought baseball cards with us. And, uh, of course, on Sundays, we'd always get together and play baseball. The kids right there in here, people from out would come in. Sometimes on Sunday, we'd have folks from 10 years old to 40 years old, because a lot of the daddies and stuff, they'd come out and play baseball too. And uh, some of us real close there in town said, we'd build us a baseball field, because we'd just play on any cow pasture we could find. And we found a little flat area right close to our house, and uh, we decided we'd build a baseball field. And we did. We had a home run fence, backstop, bases, and a whole deal for it to play on Sunday. And of course, and I thought about it later. We didn't know whose land it was. <laughs> Never thought about it. Nobody ever run us off. The fellow that owned it probably played with us. I don't know. But I kept thought, now you couldn't do that today. Uh, some of my real close neighbors, uh, and uh, I'm not going to name a whole lot of names in what I'm talking about, but. But Bruce Rich was the oldest friend I had. A lawyer here in Ripley. Uh, I think he was uh, like a county prosecutor at one time or something to that effect. Uh, uh, and uh, around the wheel back, furniture place down here. Jerry Crawford married uh, Linda Holliday. One of my real, real close neighbors are in Cleveland. <coughs> the, uh, I guess the Besides, besides playing baseball, in the evening, supposed to, the service station was the hangout, and especially in the evening, people getting off work and stuff like that. And we had to work during the day mostly, had little jobs to do, and we'd get together in the evening, and uh, our service station was right across from Baptist Church. Well, we played court ball on the yard of the Baptist Church. And if you don't, you don't know what court ball is, it's just like a, a court come out of a wine bottle. And we taped that thing, and you threw it underhand, and you could throw curve balls, drops, a lot of speed, and we used a, a broom handle to hit it with. And we'd play that till it got just pitch dark. And that was our sports in Cleveland. The, the biggest memory about sports is in, in 1964 and 1965, they were going to start a Pony League baseball league there in in Warren and Cleveland. They had a team from Cleveland, one from Tipperville, Brownfield, and one from Warren. And the, the person who started it was a baseball coach at Warren. So when we all, we called them all to meet in there and uh, talk about the rules and regulations and all. And they got down to the age limit. And I was just a month or two too old to play. So they made me the coach at Cleveland. And again, folks around Cleveland, uh, when we practiced, we practiced one day a week and played one day a week. And uh, they were always, the, the players on the team were always there at practice and always there for games. 
and other towns, Walnut and so forth, they didn't always have everybody there. But the parents made sure you got that. We won the little Pony League Championship two years in a row. And at the end of the, the last one, the, my most cherished possession is the kids all signed the baseball and gave it to me. And I still got it and I'll still keep it. And that's my baseball. The, uh, uh, of these kids that, that played around Cleveland at that time, three of them went on to play at Northeast Junior College. One of them went to Ole Miss to play basketball and one went to Ole Miss to play football. So there's pretty good athletes right there in that little area. Uh, going back to school, and my memories of school was not classroom. Uh, I really didn't like school too much, like recess a lot. <laughs> the elementary school was on one side of my house, high school was down on the other side. The elementary school was the old TCDC building, some of you may remember. And of course it's burned now. But, uh, and of course my mother taught school over at the elementary school. So when I'd hear kids hollering and cutting up, I left the house, went home to play during the break. I wasn't in school. And uh, the mother used to tell me, well, it took, took me eight years to get through four grades. Because <laughs> uh, I, I was at school playing and stuff, but when class had started, I was, I was too young anyway. I'd go back home. <coughs> but my first memory of school is milk. Now, Mr. Robert Ray lived across the hall from us, and uh, he, he, had, uh, he was the uh, <coughs> bricklayer there in town. He, most of the houses laid their own brick. He laid the bricks for them. And Mr. Robert Ray had cows, and he milked the cows, and he would deliver the milk to our house and anybody else's house. The only thing about that milk was, oh, it smelled like bitter weeds. It tasted like onions. It was awful. Mother mixed uh, powdered milk and anything else she could in to get us to drink. But when I first went to school, we got them little six ounce glass jars with a little cardboard stopper in it. I thought that was the greatest taste I've ever got hold of. <laughs> uh, Troy Holiday, as you know from here at Ripley, believe he's got a name on his uh, on the building over at Northeast Junior College. Troy Holiday was our my eighth grade teacher and my principal there at Cleveland before I moved on to Walnut to high school. The high school, well, Cleveland had a high school until 1956. And then they moved it on to Walnut State eighth grade school after that. As I just mentioned to some around a while ago, my biggest memories of the people that lived in, in uh, Cleveland. We nicknamed all the older guys that, uh, run businesses and stuff like that, not to their face. And uh, even today, when I, when I run up on some guys that was uh, that lived at Cleveland at one time, the first thing that comes up, hey, remember when? <laughs> and it's always a story to tell. Remember when you, we did this, you remember what old so-and-so did and stuff like that. We could talk all day about stuff that went on at Cleveland. Some of the people that lived in Cleveland at the time was uh, Alton Rich and Graham Hudson. And this is probably the biggest industry in Cleveland. And they had chicken yards, turkey yards, and they sold eggs. We had a doctor in Cleveland, Dr. Green. He uh, had a home there in Cleveland, but he had an office in Walmart. As far as I know, Dr. Green never drove, drove himself anywhere. I don't even know if he could drive, because his wife would drive him to work every day at Walmart. And uh, then in the middle of the night when there was a delivery to be made or somebody was sick or something had happened, uh, Dr. Green would come to my daddy and say, take me so-and-so. And he never failed to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning or whenever, and they would spend the rest of the night in whatever emergency was. I had two churches, like I mentioned, the Baptist Church is still sitting there today. Uh, it looks exactly like it did before. And there was a Methodist Church there in Cleveland that... Uh, I think the building is still there, but it's not a Methodist anymore. There's been two or three denominations in it since then. Uh, and I mentioned the service station a while ago. There are two service stations in Cleveland, and I want to tell you the history of them. The original service station in Cleveland dates back, as far as I could find, about 80 years in the Jackson family. LaBorty Jackson, which is my granddaddy, 
We had the service station. When my daddy, Daniel Jackson, got old enough to, or got out, got out of school, they would run the service station together. And then my daddy, Daniel, went off to World War II. When he come back, he worked at the service station for a short time. He bought the station in Ripley. We had the junkyard, and then he bought the station on the other end of town. So by the time the boy was getting too old to run the service station, got out of it. My uncle, Doc Jackson, took the service station over, and he ran it for years. And then it ended up with Bobby Jackson, his son, running the service station up until 2013. And then they sold it to Tim Watson with the paper. And Tim's got a little a small grocery store in there now. But 80 years. Of the immediate family ran one service station. Had a couple. Of, had a barber shop in Cleveland one time. Now the old barber was kind of old, and, and he would uh, leave a big chunk of hair cut off where he didn't need to every once in a while. Everybody called him Gappy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, grocery stores, in and out grocery stores. Uh, the Bordy. I reckon he he retired from service station. Just couldn't stay home with his wife long at one time, so he opened up a little grocery store downtown. And uh, well, the other, the other service, uh, grocery store when I was there was owned by uh, Gorman Powell. And the uh, thing about Mr. Gorman was he bought him an Edsel. And that's back when Edsel didn't last but about two years. It just wasn't a popular car. But Mr. Gorman drove that Edsel around Cleveland for years and years. Uh, Alton Rich also owned the feed store there, uh, the same one he owned the, the chicken houses. And he also had, uh, uh, I don't know, general store, I guess what you call it, you buy anything you wanted in there, cooking utensils or whatever. Uh, had a library, we still have a library in Cleveland, and they had one back when I was. I didn't go in there much, but I knew it was there. <laughs> uh, they had the Masonic Lodge in Cleveland, upstairs. The whole top of one of the buildings was Sonic Lodge, and they used my daddy's parking lot, the uh, service station, uh, to park the cars to go to the Sonic Lodge. And we'd, we'd always ask those guys, what do y'all do up there? What's going on up there? <laughs> and of course, they're not going to tell you anything. Very secret organization. And finally, one night, one of them said, oh, we're going to go ride a donkey. <laughs> so that, that became the thing. You know, when we saw them meeting, they said, hey, man, they ride, they ride there riding that donkey tonight. And that was the Sonic Lodge. <laughs> Had a uh, uh, post office in Cleveland. Uh, it was a big one too. But uh, the first one I knew that uh, ran the post office was a guy by the name, everybody called him Uncle Dick Jones. And uh, Uncle Dick liked to drink a lot. And sometimes he just couldn't hold off to the end of the day. And he took the, the mail from Cleveland over to Walnut every day around 4 or 5 o'clock. And this one day, you're going into Walnut, you cross the railroad track, and kind of go straight down. Well, to the immediate, to the left, was the original post office in. Well, up and Dick come over that hill, they don't really know what happened, but he never checked up. He hit the corner of that building, and it, his pickup looked like that. And I'm, we're, we're talking about, the, this was in the 50s, and the, when they made cars, they were made out of iron and steel. And that's the things we got today, but it bent that, and he never, he, he never hit his brake. He was all right. He was all right. But uh, sooner after that, they decided, well, maybe they need to move the post office somewhere else. Yeah. So they put it in my uncle's place in Gordon Jackson. <laughs> we had a welder uh, there in Cleveland. And man, he could make anything. Sharpen anything, make anything. But his claim to fame was, uh, his name was Mr. Woodley, and he had a grandson that played football at LSU. And then went on and played pro football for a number of years. <coughs> the other great thing about uh, about Cleveland was sidewalks. We had a sidewalk that ran completely through town all the way east to the last house and, com and through town all the way south to the last house. And of course, when you got a bicycle and you got a smooth, pretty smooth place to ride, the, the, the uh, sidewalk was great. And of course, you got to remember back. It was we was on red clay roads and some gravel, but they were rough and potholes and all that. So we would ride on those sidewalks. One day we were on the sidewalk and we heard horn blow. I mean, it was a steady horn blow. And we knew, kind of knew what it was. And, and I was uh, eight, nine, 10 years old. 
And so we stopped. And they, uh, what it was, and we knew, we, we kind of knew what was coming. They run a lot of whiskey through Cleveland. From Boonville and Jumpertown, they'd come through the back roads and come through Cleveland. They'd go to Memphis or they'd go to Tennessee. And this certain day, the cops got after them. And as we listened to that horn blowing, we just stopped and waited. And all of a sudden, here's our big Lincoln jumped up on the, the flat of Cleveland coming through town. Back end was so low on me, it was just picking up gravel. And of course, that's a good way to tell if somebody had a little whiskey in the car when it's sitting down there low. And the police were, a second or two later, the police were right behind them. And the police knew that if they ever, these whiskey runners, if they ever got to the back roads around Cleveland, they couldn't catch them. Because that big heavy car had hang to the road, and it was just so many little roads here and yonder and everywhere. But uh, I've seen quite a few uh, police chases through Cleveland when I was just a kid. The, uh, there was also, uh, I guess this is an industry, a bootlegger in Cleveland that sold beer. Everybody knew about him, about him when I was in the ninth, tenth grade. Uh, nothing was ever done about it. Uh, it was just another industry we had. <laughs> and one, uh, one day when I uh, was down at the service station, they come, they come, somebody came in and said, hey, we just busted, they just busted steel up a mile from my house. And of course, we got on the bicycle. We knew what they were talking about. We got on the bicycle and we go down there. We go start walking down the hill and the cops are bringing this guy up the hill. Had him handcuffed and all. When he got close to me, he looked at me and he said, hey, Donnie, what are you doing down here? I said, oh, I just come looking around. He said, you know, I don't know how I got off down here. <laughs> <laughs> took long. And we found out later that uh, when you walk up on one of these steels, and, and a lot of people made good whiskey. These were the folks that made bad whiskey most of the time. And we walk up on these homemade steels, you can beat the car, beat you to it, and you couldn't see it. They had them things heated. And what the police did was they followed buzzards. When they saw a lot of buzzards get circling in one spot, they figured that was a steel down there. So we went out walking them down to the steel. He had two 55 gallon drums of mash. And most of the time they use corn or just about anything that would ferment, put, put water and sugar in it, and then put a fire on it, burn it. And then what ran off of this was the white whiskey. The only problem with it, so many of them used radiators out of a car to uh, clean off the trash and stuff like that. Well, that radiator had lead in it. And a lot of people got lead poisoning. And we called it jet lead simply because most of them that got it that didn't die, it, it was like one leg was shorter than the other. <laughs> we were always new to ones. Yep, you got a whole some bad whiskey. But that's, that's, uh, that's what was happening around there at that time. Go back to the service station. My whole life was around the service station. There's some good things I'm going to tell you about a service station. There's some bad things I'm going to tell you about a service station. And I was right there with them as a kid from four or five years old to 17, 18 years old, right in the middle of it. I had no idea how bad it was at times. It was just a way of life. That was it. That's what we did. Uh, the, the good thing, some of the good things, was folks in the evening, when they got off from work, they stopped by the service in a good gathering place before they went home. And they wanted cocoa. And Daddy had a little machine that only sold the little old six ounce Coca-Colas. If you remember them, real thick bottles. And when uh, the evening sun hit that Coke box, and by six o'clock, five or six o'clock, when you got Coke out of it, ice would start pushing right up out of the top. And they were good and cold. They always had to have my nail and a peanut before they went home and drank the Coke. <clears throat> One of the uh, things that always went on at the service station around World Series times was they bet on the world if they had a World Series pool. And it wasn't, it wasn't betting on one team or the other. What they bet on was the number of runs scored in one inning. So two teams bet and that they total that score. Well, what you did was they, they put money in a pot, they drew out a number. And if your number was number three and they scored the most runs in that inning, you won that pot. So they really didn't bet on teams or nothing like that, but they would do that for the seven-game series. That was every year they did this. Uh, 
my, my biggest memory about the service station all I learned to drive. I drove wreckers and pool cars when I was 14, 13, 14 years old. Uh, way before you even thought about getting a driver's license. We buy old junk cars from, from Corian and bring them back on Highway 72 to Cleveland. When uh, didn't, I didn't even need to be driving on gravel roads. The daddy put them in to take it home. And uh, we, did, we did that a lot. And one of the best lessons I ever learned Coming off old 72 to the original 72 was pretty curvy. And so I was in a car in front of him. Daddy had one behind him in a record. But he'd always take three or four people with him to buy three or four cars, bring them back to the junkyard and junk them out. So I thought I was going a little bit too fast and this curve there, and I lost it. And I was over in the ditch, scared to death. Wasn't scared because of the wreck. I was scared because Daddy was behind me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he, uh, he usually hit first, talk second. So I was looking for a good whipping from that running off the road. Well, he, he stopped. I didn't get out of the car. He walked up to the car and he looked at me. I didn't even saw no blood running out. And he said, get out. Then he hooked the chain to the car. He went up the chain, pulled it back on the road, got back in it, and I thought, well, I'm gonna catch it now when I get home. I can't tell you all he said to me, but at the end he said, Drive this car on home and keep it out of the ditch. <laughs> and I learned a big lesson right there. Keep them out of the ditch. <laughs> the, uh, one of the sports they played around there was shooting washers. And it just goes along with getting their coat and their peanuts and all that. They dig two holes in the ground, just like horseshoes. And uh, had four on you know, a team, and they would, they would shoot these washers. And, uh, on, on good days, when, when the, I guess when the service station is so good and they had silver dollars, they'd shoot silver dollars. And I thought, maybe so. Here they are. Uh, you had to have 10, you had to have 10 for the game. And here they are shooting silver dollars, throwing them on the ground as, as their sport. But this was a, this was a everyday thing. When it was, when it's cold, you didn't get out. Uh, a lot of jokes carried on. Uh, my favorite one was, and Daddy used to say, this is for the uh, loafers. And a lot of folks would come by and, you know, just say it, talk. Quiddling was a big thing. God gracious, it took us an hour to clean up the shavings after at night for uh, when folks sitting there whittling. But they could, they could, and they would see who could, run, who could cut off the longest curl without it breaking. And of course, they talked and told jokes and, and good stuff like that. But Daddy would, uh, a condenser, little piece of metal like that with a wire on it, metal end on it, and this went in, went in the uh, points. You don't have them, you don't see them now. But it had these little condensers. And Daddy would load these condensers up. He could put them on a battery charger, both ends, and it would hold the charge. Well, he'd have four or five there, and he'd just go around on tables and stuff, uh, and the window frames and all that, just leave them. And if you ever saw one, you just couldn't help it. I mean, you just, you, know, you just had to pick it up and look at it. Well, when you picked it up, it was all right. But if, when you held it and you touched that other wire, it would knock the fool out of it. <laughs> of course, they thought that was funny. Everybody just hollered. And, and when somebody picked one up, everybody else just waved and watched. And he going to get it. He going to get it. That's the kind of games they play. The, uh, now, that's, that's good things went on. Here's some bad things that went on around the service station. Goodness gracious, there was fights all the time, especially Saturday night when nobody uh, got enough to drink. Saturday, it, it was the, the, the place to go was the service station, see everybody. Well, it's always getting into it. Uh, at one time, uh, two brothers got into it down our service station. One hit the other one head with a thick Coca-Cola bottle I was telling you about. Busted all the pieces, blood everywhere. And we had to get them broke up. Uh, we were afraid somebody's going to get killed here. So we had to separate them. Had to separate a lot of people during fights. One morning I went down to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I couldn't have been 14, 15 years old. And there's a pickup sitting right in front of the pumps. And uh, walked up to the pickup, and the guys had been out drinking all night, couldn't make it home. One of them had his head laying on the steering wheel, and the other one had his face laying up against the glass on the other side. Well, it was just such a temptation, I couldn't help it. I just went up and opened the door. 
<laughs> he fell out on the ground, gravel. He come up. He looked over and he thought the other guy had pushed him out of the truck. <laughs> he goes around that truck, opens the door, jerks him out, and it just it's just like two cats fighting. They were just as fast out there. Well, we let them go for a while, and that's we got to get them out of here. So can't get nobody get to the pumps, get to sell gas. So finally, we got them settled down, got in their pickup, sent them on their way. But there's a lot, a lot of stuff like that happened around there. The, uh, the big times at the service station was election time. And uh, any time that the sheriff was running or supervisor was running, this was, uh, they, and you never seen such crowds there. We couldn't do nothing at the service station because there's so many cars sitting around there. Our service station was located right at the end of the driveway of Cleveland School. And they always had the election in Cleveland School. Of course, the church right across the road anyway. There was more beer given away in Cleveland and Tiffin County ever thought about. Because <laughs> folks so, uh, that was supporting one of the candidates and all, always had cases of beer and then, yeah, take this and vote for my man. Take this and vote for my man. And it was just wide open. But it, it ain't no telling how much beer they gave away. And then on the, uh, that's, that's not bad, but on the worst side of it, some people didn't want beer, they wanted money. And uh, back in those times, if you didn't buy boat, boats, if you didn't pay for boats, you get beat. And sometimes it was a bidding about it. Uh, so and so was giving $20 to vote. Well, we'll give 25 and Then they go back and forth. They knew who, you knew who the people were that had the money. You could tell by looking at them. Some of them would, would stand way off across the road at the church. Some would stand down below our service station. And you could tell people would go to talk to them, and they'd go to the other and talk to them. When they finally reached a deal, they would walk, march them over to the election poll and follow them in and watch them vote to make sure they voted who they were getting paid to. And then when they got through voting, they would go back to the money man. He was paying for voting. Now, that was just wide open. I knew what was going on. Everybody else knew what was going on. Again, that's the way it used to be. Don't have that now. But that's the way elections were run. Uh, the last bad thing in the world that ever happened to me at a service station was that I listened to all these stories and I listened to all these guys coming in and been drinking and drunk. And I listened to just the way guys talk around the service station sometimes. And I picked it all up. And uh, when I was five, six years old, I got banned from the service station. They wouldn't let me go over there. Because I spent the whole day over there playing and stuff like that until I got big enough to go to work. Then I worked over there. But, uh, and, and they, you know, mom and dad didn't explain nothing then. They said, you're not going over there no more. And I couldn't understand why. Later, mother told me, she said, good gracious. She said, do you need more words than anything? That, she said, I didn't even know what you were talking about half the time. And she said, I didn't know what they meant. <laughs> and I thought later, well, I didn't know what they meant either. I just heard them enough. Oh, I could repeat them. She said I could roll the cuss words off. So they did ban me the station. Well, how are you just killing me? And just like any kid, I begged and I pleaded. And finally they said, okay, you can come back to the service station, but you can't be over there from 4 o'clock to dark. When if any trouble comes up, you got to go home and stuff like that. So, oh, yeah, I did that. What I learned out of that, don't cuss around mom and daddy. But I could use it any other place. <laughs> Cleveland, like uh, any other town, uh, got some great people, but we had some uh, crime in Cleveland. Uh, more than once, the service station broken into. Of course, they couldn't get anything. They'd steal the cash register. We'd find it down behind the service station. Might be a little change in it, but there wasn't no money in it. And when they called the sheriff, the time the sheriff got there, everybody knew who did it. He didn't have to do nothing. Oh, we know who did it. Or oh, they'd break in and steal cigarettes and stuff. Nothing big, but they still break in. Now, while, while the time that I was living in Cleveland, there was uh, a few murders. There were two old boys that went off hunting. This is what the stories told them. They went off hunting, and one of them got shot in the back. Nobody was ever arrested. They went to the guy said it was a accident. Come find out these two old boys, and, and the question was a lot of people ask, even, and I hear this around the service station, why in the world were they off hunting? They hated each other. 
but nothing was ever done about it because it couldn't prove anything. And uh, another one was a girl that I knew fairly well. She, her husband used to beat up on her pretty good, so she went back home. And the husband thought, well, I'm gonna go get my wife. And he stepped up on the front porch of the house and his mother-in-law blew him off with a double barrel shotgun. <laughs> and the, and uh, the census of that was, he'd been needing this a long time. <laughs> and so, no rest, nothing's ever done. And the, wor the worst thing, I guess, that happened during this time was one of the, one of the guys that I was friend of, same age as me, his, uh, his daddy beat his mother to death in the bed one morning with a baseball bat. And of course, and like I said, we had some bad things happen in this small town. <coughs> the uh, last thing I want to leave you with is uh, our local hero called Pat Harrison. Anybody ever heard of Pat Harrison? Yes. yes. All right. Pat was a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. And uh, he volunteered in Vietnam to fly bombing raids. Pat Harrison was the best I have ever seen in a jet plane. I've seen Blue Angels, they ain't nothing. He can do things that they even thought about doing. But Pat loved, loved to come in low and fast, and that's what they needed in, during the war. Now, when he got out, uh, Pat became a crop duster from in Arkansas. And uh, the story is, and I don't know if it's true, I believe it, that Pat, when he was crop dusting the field, instead of pulling up with the light wires, he went under the light wire and never checked up for them. And uh, why I believe this, he did so much with a jet that I said, ain't no doubt in my mind he could do that. And the last, one of the last times I saw Pat Ashley come by my mother and daddy's house, and I happened to be there, he'd come out and he had a, a cast on one leg and a cast on the other leg, and he'd uh, hung one of those electric wires over in Arkansas. But, you know, one it hadn't killed him, but he did. Now, Pat didn't follow the rules, but he sure put on a great show. And when he was he was located at one time in Columbus Air Force Base, and when they had a flight plan flying anywhere near Cleveland, Pat just diverted off of that and came to Cleveland, because that's what got him in trouble. Right? They told him, don't do this, don't do that. He'd come in low and fast. You never knew when he was around, but he would scare you to death. <laughs> People would come out of the stores and their houses and come out and watch him. They, they knew he was going to put them on the show. Just like that. Just <laughs> <laughs> that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing what he sounded like when he came up over. But he would come back down the main street and he would he would be low and fast and he would come up, he'd do figure eights. I even seen him come over upside down. And I mean you could you could you felt like you could reach out and touch that plane as close. You could see him in there just like he was one of y'all sitting here talking. And but he, he could he could fly a jet plane. And he loved to entertain the people in place. The the I guess his best stunt was and you could watch it. He'd take that plane and he'd go straight up in there, the right side. And then he'd come right straight back down. And you'd think, oh my goodness, he ain't gonna pull out this thing. <laughs> well he would he would bust a sound barrier when he did that. Pull out at the last time. He shattered windows and houses, the old houses at Cleveland. He knocked pictures off the walls. Doors, they say, were just shaped like that. The whole house was shaped because he would get right down on top of it. Uh, his daddy told a story down at the junkyard, I mean, down at the service station one time. His daddy was Bennett Harrison. And Bennett had a few good words to say about Pat that day. Bennett was down in Cleveland Bottom. Uh, Will Mew breaking up ground for his garden. And Pat comes over and right down on the ground. Bennett said it scared him to death, didn't even know he was anywhere around. That old Mew laid down. <laughs> Pat, Pat said, I, I mean, Bennett said, I tried everything in the world. I kicked him and pulled him and left him after him, but that Mew would get up. And he got tired of fooling with him. He went on back to the house and he decided that, well, that Mew will die down there if we don't get him up. So he went back and finally got the mule up. But he had a, quite a few good names called Pat that day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting me.
I guess if you ask me a question, I can tell you a story about somebody <laughs> in Cleveland. But that's the way it was. Back around six fifties, sixties and seventies. So thank you for having me. And y'all have a great day. Well, I'm, I'm not really one in charge. I'd, I'd like to ask you just a general. We're the same age. I worked at a gas station too. We've got a dollar an hour. We had to do windows and wash cars and everything else. Looking back, everybody reminisced memory lane or, or could relate to what you were saying. And uh, I, I know those times. Just as an opinion, fast forward, consider the times these kids are at today. What do you think about this next X generation compared to the generation we came from? Do you think, you know, I, I just think it's going to be a whole different change of character. I mean, there was no, there was no character building today, nowadays. There's no, uh, compared to hearing tales and the, the things went over at the gas station and stuff, you know. Well, the, I just the kids don't get out. Kids don't get out of work today is one thing. Mm -hmm. They got the video game. They got the phone in front of them. They're doing that all the time. <laughs> right. And uh, they don't know what work is. You had a good job. My dad didn't pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got up. You went to work when I do. You go you quit when I do. And that was, it wasn't no, uh, I don't even remember getting an allowance. Now, I'm sure I got money when I went to school for lunch and stuff like that. But he didn't he didn't pay out. Mm -hmm. Even when I was in Mississippi State, I'd come home on weekends and he'd have jobs lined up for me because at that time he was getting too old to put on mufflers and shocks and all that. Well, he'd have Saturday lined up for me to work to make money to go back to school the next week. Uh, I don't know. Ch things are changing. I don't even know how to guess from the change of when I was there, when I was growing up in Cleveland, are just growing up until what kids are growing up in now. Uh, there's so many in the My daddy wanted to put in a self-service service station in the 50s and 60s. And everybody thought, we ever heard something like that. And now, you know, that's the thing. Daddy would take, uh, you bought, and everybody bought a dollar worth of gas. You know, you never filled up a car because you could put three gallons in it back then for a dollar. And, uh, but it was, it was just dollar you to death. And he would take off, if you bought a dollar's worth of gas, he'd give you a dollar and five cents. Back then. That was his discount, but he just added it to the, the paying 95 cents for a gallon of gas he was daddy doing. So he had, he had, he was way ahead of his time. I didn't realize it. Of course, you know, kids, you don't ever listen to nobody. You know it all anyway. But I wouldn't, I don't know about this. Heck, we may not even, uh, they may not even use service stations uh, like they do now in, in the future. Uh, you ride by, show a card, gas you up, you go. That's about what we do anyway. I really miss having my windshield cleaned up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I've cleaned many of them, many of them. I was so small uh, when, uh, when Daddy on the service station down here at Richmond, he put me up to, on the trucks and washed with you. <laughs> but yeah, I, I remember when you pulled up, it didn't make no difference. You wanted air or if you bought anything, you got your windshield washed. Mm -hmm. Tim, Tim McCoy told me one day he was bushhogging when Pat Harrison come over to jet and he said he could feel the exhaust. I wouldn't have. And I, I thought maybe he was exaggerating, but I don't think he was, man. I really believe he was. Chip would do that now, exaggerate. <laughs> but uh, I tend to believe him because I've seen it. I, I've just seen well, him. I, I, I thought him, you could touch that place. I saw him barrel roll over Tippersville one time, and I could see him coming down the highway in the rear view mirror of my car. That's how low he was. <laughs> and when he got there in front of Ray's service station, he just went up and rolled it over. He was something. I mean, if you've never seen him, he was something. And like I said, he just, he wasn't supposed to be doing that. That was really dangerous. Did Bobby do that? Where did he land? Where did he keep this plane at? Columbus Air Force Base. Right? When he was close, when usually he was flying patterned somewhere. If he got close to Cleveland, uh, Tipperville won. 
Well, if it was bad, he didn't. He didn't care about flying up there. He wanted to be down here. Well, that's 